You're listening to a message presented at New Market Christian Church. We're located at 300 South 3rd Street in New Market, Indiana. We meet for Sunday school at 9 o'clock and for worship at 10 o'clock each Sunday morning. If you do not have a church home, we'd love to invite you to join us here at New Market Christian Church. And now, a message by Dr. Gary Snowden. As we get started this morning, I want to let you know that I titled this morning's message, We Are Family. And that's exactly what we are. Our focus text this morning is found in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. We'll read these words. It says, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Hold that in readiness. We'll look at that passage throughout the rest of the morning. Would you pray with me as we get started? Dear God, as we come here in your house today, I ask that you'll use me as your vessel. Help me to rightly divide your word of truth. Let your spirit work through me. Dear Lord, help it to be about you. Help us to exalt you as we come to understand we are indeed family. Bless this time together. Let us exalt you through our worship. For it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Well, as we start talking about this idea of family, I just wondered if you've ever had any difficulty getting close to people. Is that ever? It seems like it, it should be such an easy thing to do, to become close to someone. But the reality is, sometimes you meet somebody, and it might be the same person, and you meet them, and you just want to run up and give them a great big hug. You know what I mean? You just see them, they're just so lovable. You just want to run up and give them a great big hug. And the next time you meet, they have done something that bugs you to no end, and all you want to do is push them away. I know you're looking at me like I'm the only one that that ever happens to. <laughs> but, but isn't it true? Sometimes you just want to hug somebody up and, 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 and let them know you love them the next time you want to keep them at a distance because they have just ruffled your feathers. Friends, that's just the way relationships roll. Sometimes we feel closer than we do at other times. A peanut comic, you know those, those Charles Schultz comics that he used to draw? There's an old one that it said, sometimes we are huggable and sometimes we are buggable. So think about that. Isn't that sort of the way it is? Sometimes we do really feel like we want to run up and hug somebody and sometimes they bug us to no end. But this dichotomy of relationships, it doesn't change the fact that we need one another. It doesn't change that. We need one another. The two greatest emotional needs of mankind, according to leading psychologists, if you put any stake in them, but according to leading psychologists, the greatest two emotional needs of mankind is a sense of worthwhileness, and a sense of belongingness. We want to feel that we belong someplace and that what we're doing is making a difference. And whenever I look at my own life, I think they pretty much hit the nail on the head. That's two things that I desire greatly. I want to feel that I belong and I want to feel that I make a difference. You know, we need each other, yet at times, I promise you, we will annoy the living daylights out of one another. Because it's just the way it is. We are like two porcupines. When we get together. Isn't that a reality? We're like porcupines sometimes. When we get all huddled up close together to protect ourselves in the cold of night, the closer we get, the prickly we become. That's a hard word to say. I'll try that pricklier, try that sometime, the pricklier we become. It seems that people that we care about the most are sometimes the ones that can cut us the deepest. 
that can poke us with those, with those quills the very hardest. Because they, they know right where to put them. You ever notice that? Sometimes I think our feeling of closeness, even with those we love, can be on again and off again. On again and off again. You ever notice that? I mean, it's even true with husbands and wives. I ain't going any farther. <laughs> sometimes it's just smart to stop. But, but, but it is true sometimes, even of husbands and wives. An old church saying puts it like this. We long to live in heaven together in God's glory. But to live here on earth, well, that's another story. <laughs> Isn't that kind of true? I think verse 8 is kind of going to sum all this up for us, this idea of family. And we wanted to look at that this morning. There in verse number 8 it says, and, and we're just going to stop at different places along the line. It says, finally, all of you. And we'll stop right there on all of you. You notice it on the screen, all lit up in yellow there. Let's focus on that all of you for a minute. It says, finally, all of you. That's the first truth this morning. See, if you got the handouts, not a real big one. It's all of you is what that one is right there. Peter is speaking to all of us. What that tells me is there's not a single person in this room that this won't apply to. It's for all of us. And that pretty much covers everyone. None of us are exempt from the truths found in this verse here in 1 Peter. And because of that, we need to take 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 to heart. You know, we are all believers on this journey that we call life. That means we are traveling through life on this globe together. And as believers in Jesus Christ, you know what? We are one big family. And that brings us to our second truth this morning. Let's continue reading there in verse 8. It says, finally all of you have unity of mind. And we'll stop right there on those those words, unity of mind. What in the world does that mean? You've ever read through scripture and you get to something and you think to yourself, oh I read it, but I have no idea what it meant. I think we do that sometimes. I want to take time to kind of break it down and look at it. It's speaking to all of us and it's telling us we should have unity of mind. As a family, we should have this unity of mind. Or to put it another way, we are expected to live together in harmony. He wants us to get along with one another. It's not a command to become spiritual clones. It doesn't mean we have to all do the same thing at the same time in the same way. It's not talking about that. It's saying in Christ we should recognize our common bond. Harmony is created when we have this oneness of mind and heart. When we come to understand that we need to be in sync with Jesus, so in sync with him that we automatically have similarity of purpose, similarity in our desires. Why? Because we desire as a unit what Christ desires for his church. As kingdom walkers, did you know, doesn't matter who you are, what kind of title you wear, as kingdom walkers, we are all, get this, given the same commission. You heard it before. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, for lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth or the age, depending on your translation. You heard that before, right? That is our commission as a church. That is our commission as a family. We are to make disciples. We are to baptize them to Christ. We are to teach them what it means to be a part of the family of God. That's our commission. And it sounds easy enough. I mean, when you examine that from a distance, it sounds really, really easy. Let's, it's just a couple little verses. That's all Jesus asked of us. Let's go do it. But the real, the real rub comes in when we begin to recognize that this unity, that this harmony, this harmony of purpose, this harmony in our commission means that we've got to be together with one another. We've got to rub proverbial shoulders with one another if we're going to do this effectively. We've got to learn to get along with one another in this thing we call the family of God. 
Now, it's easy to suck it up for just a little while, every now and then, and get along for a few days. That's not too bad, is it? I mean, that's one nice thing about in-laws. You can survive it. It doesn't last all that long. And then you're out of there again. It, it, you can survive anything for a little while. But that's not living in relationship. And God wants his family to live in relationship. That means that you and I need to be in regular contact with one another. And I think sometimes we miss that point. We think it's good enough to come warm up a spot on one of these pews on Sunday morning. But God wants more than that for us. He wants us to be a family. And that's why worship time like we have right now is so important. But that's also why communion, when we gather around this table, is so important. It's also why small group activities are so important. We've talked about Denny's class having events outside of the church. We've talked about B's class having events outside of the church. We've talked about Gary's class having events outside of the church so they could fellowship together having activities that would draw people into relationship with one another. Those times are not just for fun. They build relationships. And relationships are important. We want them to be fun. Or else why would you want to go to them? But we need to understand there is a purpose. There is a method to the madness. We are seeking to build relationships in the body of Christ, in the family of God. You know, those times of fellowships are extremely important. Failing to commit to this kind of family togetherness causes our spiritual flames to flicker and eventually go out. If you're not connected to the family of God, it's going to be really easy to grow cold in your relationship to Almighty God. It's a lot like a red-hot ember getting knocked out of the campfire. Man, when it is in that campfire, that thing is glowing red-hot. And it is putting off some heat, and you can roast those marshmallows just fine. But you kick that ember out of the fire. It'll lay over there a few minutes, and the red will start to dis disappear, and it'll turn gray. And it'll go out. Sure, it can burn for a little while on its own out there, but soon it's going to cool off. That ember burns best when it's where it needs to be. And we burn best when we're where we need to be. Inside the family of God. The church family is the fire that keeps us burning when it comes to our relationship with God and with one another. There's no avoiding it. As believers, we are part of a great big family. And if you think this is all the family there is, you are sadly mistaken. The family of God reaches around the world. Anywhere that people have come to believe in Jesus and decided to express that belief through obedient faith, anywhere there are people like that, they're a part of our family. It doesn't matter what color they are. It doesn't matter what tongue they speak. They are a part of our great big family. The family of God, if you will. Friends, we are family. There's no way around it. Families, they share some wonderful things. They share dreams. They share hopes. They even share possessions. I mean, somebody got a road tower, you need it, you borrow the road tower, you bring it back. We, we share possessions. We share memories. We share smiles. We share frowns. I'll try that sometime. We share happiness. We share, share sadness. We are a family. And a family is a clan held together with the glue of love and cemented by mutual respect. It's just a reality. Did you know that whenever a rough time comes, the family is a shelter in time of storm. Did you know that? We can be there for one another if we will live in family. No one stands alone if they are a part of a family. We need each other. But just like those porcupines, getting close to one another can cause you some real pain. Every family that spends time together, I promise you, every family that spends time together will eventually face conflict. It's just a reality. It's inevitable. There's no way to avoid 
all the things that can cause friction inside of a family. You just can't do it. There's too many of them. Even if that family is the family of God. Sometimes we're going to be like two porcupines trying to snuggle up close to one another. We're going to, we're going to be prickly. And the more people that come together, the greater the potential for that prickliness becomes. And the goal of any relationship is to avoid as much of that friction as possible so that you can build unity inside the family unit. And that's what this verse is going to help us understand how to do as we continue to tear it down and to look at it this morning. There in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, it's going to tell us how we can overcome some of the friction that wants to make its way into the family of God. Here's what it says there. It says we need to walk in one another's shoes. <laughs> now, it doesn't say those words. This is what it says. Let's read verse 8 there again. It says, finally, all of you have unity of mind. And then see that big word that's highlighted in yellow? Sympathy. Sympathy. We are to be sympathetic toward one another. Sympathy means that we are to try and understand and validate the feelings of those around us. Whew. Man, that can be a chore sometimes. It can be a chore sometimes. Now, it doesn't say we have to validate one another's ideas. That's not what it's talking about. You know, some ideas can be so off the wall that there's no way they can fly. You don't have to validate every idea. It's not... A commandment to support every half-baked idea that family throws at us. That's not what it's saying. What it is saying is that we need to validate the feelings of every family member when they throw out an idea. They need to know that we are sympathetic to the way that they feel. They need to know that we understand that they're sold on their idea whether we are or not. We had that problem yesterday. Did we not? Man, it's hard to preach these sermons when it steps all over your toes. We were in here, we were moving this stuff around yesterday, getting ready for service today. And we moved that pulpit over there. And I said, I'm tired of that pulpit moving. I wish it'd just land somewhere. That didn't go over well. <clears throat> I got up to go to the pulpit this morning, I started over here, it was over there. It was like, you know, it's, you gotta feel like I'm chasing that thing. But I understand why, and once she explained why, it was a little easier for me to wrap my mind around. We needed to pull the, the piano forward in order that she would be able to hear what's going on out there. And, and I finally wrapped my mind around it. But these things aren't easy. They're not easy in our physical family, and they're not easy in our spiritual family. Our sympathy shows that we understand what someone is trying to say. And that we believe their feelings are important. And they need to be important and recognized as important even if we don't agree with them. Providing this kind of affirmation is not always an easy thing to do. To provide this kind of affirmation, you have to take time to understand where that person is coming from. You have to take time to be sympathetic with where they are. We must seek to understand not just what, what's being recommended, but why it's being recommended. We must try to be aware of the person's present and past circumstances that we're talking with. Did you know that? It makes a difference. We've got to be aware of their present circumstances or their past circumstances because these are the things that have shaped them and made them who they are. If you're not aware of them, you're not going to really know where they're coming from. These are things that have molded their attitudes toward the issues at hand. We've got to truly take time to get to know one another. And what one another has gone through, is going through, and might go through in the future. A wise old Indian put it this way. He said, I will not criticize my brother until I have walked a mile in his moccasins. And that's a pretty good idea. Steve Covey, you know that calendar guy? Uh, a lot of folks use Steve Covey's calendars and things. Steve Covey, he puts it this way. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. In essence, get to know where they are if you want them to know where you are. Let me be up front here. I'm sharing with you truth today, but I'm still working on it. I am still working on it. These are things that we all need to work on. 
me included. Trying to understand where people are coming from, it's necessary inside of a family. But I got news for you. Our egos get in the way. <laughs> they just do. We think we already know what we need to know, so we really don't care what they got to say. You ever notice that? Or we think we know what people are going to say before they're given a chance to say it, so we cut them off. It is so hard for us to listen close enough to find out where people are truly coming from. But it's our responsibility. Let's continue reading there as we continue there in verse 8. It says, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, and what comes next? Brotherly love. Brotherly love. In these verses, we find that we are on the same team. We're on the same team. Peter is saying that we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. And we need to act like brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to care about one another. We should be exhibiting something called brotherly love because we're all on the same team. Now, yeah, I'll say it. It might not hurt every now and then to even exhibit a little bit of brotherly honoriness. Because we can have fun. We're a family, right? We are family after all, and as family, we will exhibit the full scope of family quirks. And that includes picking on one another from time to time. Have a little bit of fun as you go through life. We are in com competition with one another. We should therefore be seeking to complement one another. To stand alongside of one another. When one of us succeeds, we should all be jumping up and down and saying, Hallelujah! Praise God! Thank you, Lord! I am so glad that this person succeeded because when that person succeeds, the family of God succeeds. We should have that kind of exuberance. But when the enemy attacks, we need to remember that we are connected through the blood of Jesus. We are blood brothers. And that means that we need to stand together supporting one another against the attacks of Satan. Because we are family. When Satan attacks, we need to circle up the wagons and stand together. We need to circle up the wagons and fight for one another. Satan attacks through all kinds of different ways. He'll attack through drugs or alcohol. He'll attack through discord or di divorce. He'll attack through financial challenges. He will attack through all kinds of different ways. You name it, he can find a way to use it against you. And as a family, when that begins to happen, we need to circle the wagons and stand together. Now I'm going to go to Medlin here. That means we need to quit asking a question that we so often ask. You're not going to understand it when I first start. By the time we get done, I think you will. We need to quit asking, what can I do? I'm going to let that one sink in for a minute. We need to quit asking, what can I do? So many times, that question is just a cop-out. Let me explain. We go to someone's home, we see the dishes, dishes overflowing, we know they've been having a hard time, but instead of grabbing a dish towel, we go over and stand by the door and we ask, what can I do to help? Duh! Grab a dish rag! Or, we know that someone needs gas to get back and forth to the doctor, to the hospital, but instead of giving a gas card, we stand there and we look at them and we say, what can I do to help? Duh. Give them a gas card. Uh, we see somebody having to go to the hospital and they've got their kids, there's two of them just running crazy toddlers going every which direction. But instead of asking them, can they stay with us so that you can be a little uh, more at ease when you go to the hospital or to the doctor, we stand there, look at them with all that's going on and ask, what can I do to help? Duh. We need to quit asking, what can I do to help, when it's really just a cover for not wanting to step up and do what we know needs to be done. When we see someone in need, we need to be willing to step up to the plate. 
Because we are family. And as family, we should care about one another. And we should help one another whenever and wherever we can. We shouldn't have to beg for help. Because we're family. And therefore we shouldn't demand to be asked for help. We should step up to the plate and do what needs to be done when we see a need inside of our family. Friends, there is no way around it. We all have issues that overwhelm us from time to time. Every last one of us will need help from the family from time to time. Because we need each other. We're a family. We should have a tenderness of heart toward one another that prompts us to step up to the plate whenever things get rough for somebody in the family. We should see them hurting and we should get right there by their side and support them in any way that we can through whatever they're going through. As a family, we need to quit arguing with one another and spatting with one another, acting like everything's about us and for us. And we need to start caring, maximizing our cooperation, doing all we can for one another. As children of God, we are family. And that being the case, here's what I want us to do this week. Now that we've looked at this, what does it mean to us? How are we going to put it into practice? Here's what I want us to do this week. I want us to look for somebody in our church family that could use just a little bit of help. Just keep your eyes open. Keep your ears open. You'll find them. It may be as simple as knowing that someone could use a card of encouragement and providing it. It might be stopping by to see someone who's an extended care facility and saying hello to them and let them know that you care. Well, you know, somebody helped us this way this last week. They did exactly what I am encouraging you to do. We had a bunch of limbs that fell out of our tree in the backyard this last week's storm. And last Sunday, whenever we got up and we came to church, someone had come into our yard picked all those sticks up and stacked them in a pile. They didn't come and say, can I help you with those limbs? I went to bed, limbs were there, I get up, the limbs are stacked up, I had no idea. They saw the need and they stepped up to the plate and they got involved. That's what I want us to do this week. See a need, step up to the plate and get involved. Find a family member in need and then meet that need using the gifts that God has blessed you with. If you have trouble coming up with a way to serve, I put some at the bottom of the handout this week. Look for a way to show your family that you love them and care about them because we're all a part of the family of God. If you've heard this message and you're thinking to yourself, man, I'd love to be a part of that kind of family. I'd love to be cared about by a family that cares like that. I'd like to take that next step toward becoming a member of the family of God. And if that's what you're feeling right now, if you're interested in taking that next step toward becoming a part of the family of God, then we want you to come forward today. And we will be there standing with you as you take that next step. We're going to be singing as we stand this morning, the family of God. If you're ready to give your life to Jesus, now is the time to come. Won't you stand and sing with us? You've been listening to a message presented by Dr. Gary Snowden minister at New Market Christian Church. We would love to have you come join us as we seek to worship God, love one another, and reach out to our neighbors.